Hi, welcome back to Reality and You Foundation. Today we have Lily. Lily, a school psychologist, a girl who felt very anxious and broken, but through the three principles, as she calls it, she has been perfectly whole, primed for joy and lacking nothing. Lily's tendency towards oversharing has set up an extensive and successful platform on social media. A former lead school psychologist, like I mentioned, now works towards being an anxiety coach, helping others in these issues and healing people with her mental health tips. Thank you so much for joining us, Lily. We are so grateful that you can join us on this platform to increase the awareness on anxiety. Uh, Lily, let's just start on some basic questions about, you know, what would you define as general worry vis-a-vis -vis anxiety that today we are seeing among the youth? Well, general worry, you know, and especially as I know we were talking before recording regarding COVID, general worry can sometimes generate a solution. You know, so if somebody was worried if they got, if they were going back to school or if they got invited to a party, a general worry might come up and then they might think of a solution of talking, if it's a party or a gathering, of talking to that friend and saying, is it going to be outside? How many people are going to be there? Is anybody wearing masks? And, and then you can usually with a general worry, you can kind of think of a solution and it stops the worry, you know, and if it's about maybe you did go to an event or you go back to school and you start feeling sick um, and you don't know if it's just a cold or, you know, if you think, oh no, if it's COVID and then you might think of a solution of, okay, I'm going to get a COVID test. I'll call my doctor. And generally you can, those are kind of like real life things. Um, but if it was more of an anxious, unhelpful response regarding safe feeling sick after going somewhere and you hyper-focused on the symptoms and you started Googling and, you know, and they're like really checking your throat and coughing and it would make it confusing to know, is this, is this COVID or is, is it anxiety now? Because when we get really worried, it can start a stress response. Um, and in terms of, I mean, I think moving forward with COVID when is it anxiety? Is it a general worry? It has to be a personal choice of what's going to feel good for somebody to live their best life. And sometimes that might involve being more social than other people that might actually cause more anxiety. And they think I'm actually okay to be more of an introvert and stay inside more, but somebody might be like, you know what, for my best life, I need to fully go back to school and see friends every day. And, um, but I guess in terms of general worry, it can be real life things. And sometimes with anxiety, it can be things that aren't so plausible. Um, you know, somebody might have not even left their house and start getting worried about COVID or might have a minimal interaction. And sometimes then our imagination can make up these stories and we can kind of get hijacked by, by big worries. And I think this is a very, very valid topic right now because in India, uh, you know, it's been a year and a half since schools have been shut entirely. Uh, we have a first batch of kids starting school right now on a rotation basis. And I think like you mentioned, there's going to be a lot of anxiety uh, associated with COVID and, you know, are we safe enough? Is somebody coughing or sneezing in front of me? Also, uh, you know, Lily, you were pointing out on social anxiety. A lot of friends, uh, you know, during the lockdowns and, uh, you know, online schoolings have probably changed. So how would you, uh, you know, advise the youth? How, how should we, is there, like earlier we had patterns of communicating uh, and being around people, even our physical uh, parameters were different. Uh, with COVID coming in, you know, things are going to be different right now. Well, I think to know that they're not alone. Everybody has been out of school for a year and a half. And some people, yes, are more easily can kind of go back into the flow of social, of socializing, but that it is new for everybody, you know? And so we can feel with anxiety or anxious thoughts, we can feel like we're the only one, you know, oh my gosh, this is so easy for everybody else. Um, everybody must have, you know, um, continued with their friendships. I'm sure everybody was somehow playing video games or having, you know, Zoom video party, like in it's our brain, can just tell stories. You know, that's just what a brain does. Um, a long time ago, it was paramount to our survival to be part of a tribe. And so our brain can think like, can just kind of be a little bit more dramatic. So I think it's really helpful to 
recognize that not everything we think is true. You know, thoughts are not facts that especially if we're in a low place to not take our thinking so seriously, because it's going to tell us that we're separate and it might, we might be more on, on high alert to think like, did, how am I acting? Am I, am I, am I acting strange? Am I too close? Am I, did anybody laugh at my joke? Like, did I not laugh? And to know, have a bit of distance from your brain's kind of chatter when you're in returning to social situations that like, it's okay. Everybody, or a lot of people, even though people might seem like they are just diving back into it. I know probably for most people, there is some like, oh, this is new. And, and so to remember, remember that. And then also people really like to, a lot of people like to talk about themselves. And so if somebody is nervous, if you go in and you're listening deeply and you'll ask a question about somebody and they, and they'll respond. And so you're able to listen deeply also when you can not listen to the chatter that your brain is saying. Um, and then something really cool happens, you know, when you're listening, you, you can ask. And I think being our authentic selves is also really helpful because sometimes what we worry about, oh, what if somebody judges me that I, I actually haven't left the house much in a year and a half. Somebody might be like, oh my gosh, me either. And you might have this connection or if you have a really funny laugh or actually you found this new show, um, being yourselves allows for authentic connections. And that's what people really like. And something you might be worried about might actually be somebody's favorite thing. So I think those are some big things of knowing you're not alone, listening. Um, Cause then also, even if you, if you're listening and you're yourself and you say, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. Will you tell me about that? Um, can really be helpful when we're going back into, back into social situations, back into school. And I think a very, very strong statement that you made was, uh, you know, not all thoughts are realistic, you know, uh, thoughts are not facts. Uh, and I think that that's a very strong point to take. So sometimes the mind has these recurrent negative thoughts uh, and we sort of need to challenge them. So uh, how are you looking at so social situations uh, back at home? How, how has it been for you guys? Because, uh, you know, the world has opened up faster that side. Yes. You know what? It's interesting. I was just, I think, commenting when I first went out to a restaurant for me, sometimes I can get overwhelmed with really loud and, um, you know, and a lot of people. And it was, it was interesting for me. I also am somebody that I feel like I'll get hungrier than other people. And I'm more sensitive to, so I had a friend that I would walk with a lot and that's what we would, we would get together and walk on the beach during COVID. And then when things started opening up, we went to walk and then we were going to go out to eat. And I had kind of forgot things that I used to do, such as bringing a water bottle and a snack. And so I just left my house and we walked and then we had to wait to get into this. It was just still a lot of outdoor seating. And so we were waiting and I was so hungry and I didn't, I didn't think because I got out of the practice of, and not that we have to, so I just walked to the liquor store and I got some snacks and water because I realized if I was going to be, you know, I think our wait was like an hour or something or a while. So some of it might be to remember old things. You know, if you are going out, bring a snack, bring a water bottle, if that makes you feel good, not. Um, and for me, when I was there and it was so loud, I got a bit distracted and I got worried and I thought, oh no, is my friend gonna, like my body, um, that stress alarm went off because we all have um, this amazing stress response, which can save our lives and the lives of somebody else when we're really in danger. But sometimes it just, is a false alarm, <laughs> you know? And so being uncomfortable in a restaurant or in school isn't an emergency. So, but that first fear might come because we might be like, oh my gosh, it's overstimulating or I got worried. I'm not used to being with a lot of people and that's okay. And then you can recognize there's actually not true danger. Um, so for me, what was helpful was I was really resisting it and I was caught up in my thoughts. Is my friend not gonna wanna hang out with me? I can't focus on what she's saying. And then I remembered, well, if you, what if you just didn't resist this experience and I let it go. And then what thought came and I said, I hate this experience. And it was interesting. Once I allowed myself to say, oh, you know what, this, I don't like it being so loud. I, it just stopped actually being so loud to me. Um, and I could again, focus on what she was saying. And I, and I kind of, that first fear faded away. So 
I guess my advice for anybody that is going out is to be so kind and so gentle with yourself. And it's okay if you have that first scared response, but that to remember- I just want to talk about that. Uh, so what was the scared response for you? You know, was it, is, is it like when you talk about the stress response, is it, is it a physical uh, connection with the body? Is it, is it an alarm from the body? Is your blood pressure going up? Are you sweating more? Uh, what would you call it? Yes, well, and everybody's stress response could be different, but yes, typically there are these body-wide changes that if we were in real danger, you know, our heart might be beating faster, we might be sweating, we could have more racing thoughts, people might be lightheaded. For me, it looked like, um, I think I was, I guess it will be, I noticed I have a lot more mental chatter, you know, then my thoughts seem really loud and I kept thinking, then I'll have, my brain is narrating, you know, and so, I think I felt like a little bit weak um, because I also, even though I had eaten and had my water, I was like, I'm faint. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be, and it was really loud. And so for my stress response also involves a lot of thoughts about the future, which I think is pretty common because people are like, if you stopped and you said, are you okay right now? They'd probably be like, yes, but what if, what if, but what if, what if, what if I can't take it? You know, what if I somehow lose control? And so we can be very kind of in the future of like, oh, this is intolerable, but what if it gets worse? And so for some people it can be yeah. sweating, heart rate, getting dizzy. Um, for me, sometimes it involves also feeling like a bit disconnected from reality, yep. um, which can make me feel like kind of like, oh no, am I going crazy? I mean, and not anymore, cause now it, it's very brief, but I used to then, I think my breathing would get dysregulated and, um, and so I just didn't really feel grounded. I didn't feel present. And that this was a short period, but a lot of it is like, part of my brain is like, leave, you need to leave. But on the other hand, it's, it's worrying about being judged socially. Yeah. So for me, and what I always recommend is if you can quiet your mind, have some distance from your thoughts, we don't need our brain to stop being a brain. And we don't want to have, stop having a stress response, right. but when we are not thinking that it's true, we're not, you know, kind of prolonging it, then our brain can stop kind of having that neural pathway. So sometimes we can't help it. We might have a stress response when it's a loud place or more people in COVID, but then it can short, you know, it can be short. It can fade when we recognize, okay, I'm safe, you know, uncomfortable doesn't mean unsafe. So this, this that you spoke about, you know, uh, you know, you just want to avoid the situation sometimes when it gets too loud or, you know, and we know about the fight and flight response. We also know about the freeze response now. Uh, so uh, do you think you get frozen? And if, if people do get frozen, what do you think? And what are the techniques that they can do to handle that? Well, if you get frozen, I mean, I think whatever your, your response is, I think a lot of the helpful stuff comes before. So understanding anxiety, understanding panic, understanding how our brain works, understanding, you know, thoughts and feelings. And then if it happens, oh, it can just be a signal to really take a step back from your thoughts as best as you can, like let your thoughts quiet because then, you know, if we get scared, we'll, we'll better come back into balance, you know? And I think knowing that, we are designed to come back into balance. We're designed so beautifully. And often when we add on all these techniques, we just kind of get in our own way. So that's why I think if it happens, just do the, you know, and I said, I don't, it's not like I do it perfectly, but at some point I realized, okay, I'm really caught up in my thinking and it's all to kind of take a metaphorical step back, allow my mind to quiet. And then it's such a beautiful thing because I come back into balance. Suddenly I'm able to hear what my friend is saying again, and that stress response goes down. So I think it will be helpful people. Maybe this will be an intro, you yeah. know, to people and then understanding how, how we are, how we work as human beings. So if it happens, it's not so scary. It's not like what's happening and is it going to get worse? So as best as they can, they can stay present at their thoughts at all. And then realize that, oh, you know, if they're frozen, okay, it might just be a few minutes. They'll kind of come back and they'll be able to move without them even you know, searching for what's the right technique to use now. Right. And, and I know of some cases which we have been getting, you know, post COVID, uh, you know, where kids go to school and especially teenagers, uh, they sort of have a panic, you know, they've gone to the school counselor, they sort of rush back home. And these are very realistic scenarios that we are seeing right now. 
right? Uh, so in relation to anxiety disorder, you know, uh, we know that there are certain medications that are, can be given as well. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I'm not a doctor or a psychopharmacologist or a psychiatrist. So I feel like referring to somebody that is much more knowledgeable, but what I can speak on, I do think medications can be helpful for somebody to be able to get to a place where they can hear, you know, start to understand anxiety and start to understand mental health and yeah. mental well being and how, how we are designed, you know, because sometimes if they're in such a state of of anxiety, you know, that it's really heightened because sometimes we can get really overstimulated and our brain can create patterns that it might be hard for them to hear um, or depression. You know, it can be hard for them to hear or to, for both anxiety or depression or other, um, you know, mental illnesses to do things that will actually help them return to a place of mental well being. So I think medication definitely has its place. I think, and in, you know, especially for even more psychiatric um, illnesses, yep. that it can really help people access healing information. So I and, think it's wonderful. And something back you mentioned about the social validation, you know, we want to fit in, uh, you know, starting school back and fitting in is, of course, a challenge by itself. Uh, so, you know, fitting in can also lead to a lot of loneliness, uh, you know, being isolated, being bullied, uh, and a lot of themes with that. Yes, yeah, it can. Um, and I think a lot of times, then the people that are doing the bullying are the people that need, that are hurting themselves. You know, I know it's a cliche, but it's hurt people hurt people. Yeah. And so I think the more mental health support and more you know, platform. So it's, it is reducing that stigma, whether it's on, um, also because who knows what their parents are going through too. Oftentimes people that are bullying might have that from some of their relatives. And so the more mental health that we can get, the more, um, the better off everybody will be. But if somebody is feeling lonely and isolated, my friend who I work with, he always says, if it's mentionable, it's manageable, which I really like. And so I love that there are school counselors and school psychologists and there, you know, that people can come and sometimes we just need somebody to listen to us and not even to solve it and to say, oh my gosh, wow, that sounds so hard and repeat back. And, and then sometimes kids might work out, work it out on their own. They might think they're lonely and say, nobody likes me. And then they were like, well, there's actually this one kid. And so I think allowing kids a space to talk and whether it's somebody at school or if parents are listening to this to allow kids that space to talk about it. And sometimes not even to jump into solving it right now. Sometimes it can be helpful. I know that with my kids or even my friends, I'm like, do you, do you want me to listen? Or do you want my opinion? Or do you want me to try to help you to solve this? And yeah. so, you know, asking kids that of sometimes do they just want to get it out? Um, so you're saying sometimes it's better to listen and not give your opinion, right? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think that's a very, very valid point because as parents, we want to just, give, you know, jump in and give the advice and we say, you know, and sometimes I've seen parents dismiss the child's emotion as well, that, you know, it's okay, this happens in school, uh, you know, deal with it. We've all done this in our, in our childhood. Yes, exactly. And I mean, and if parents are listening, be, no need to beat yourself up when you, because I, I, you know, and even with friends and family, sometimes I'll kind of jump to, oh, this is what I see. But I really truly try to practice it sometimes just listening. And, and there's, and you can ask those clarifying questions. Oh, so, so Mary, you know, Mary kicked you when you were playing soccer, you know, and, and then they just kind of continue on with the story. But I know for me, sometimes if I'm telling somebody something and they just jump right in with a solution, it actually feels unsatisfying. Like sometimes I do just want somebody to listen. So parents or teachers, if you are talking to kids and you could just say, do you want me to listen? Or, or you know, maybe after they're talking and then saying, do you want my opinion? Or do you want me to help you solve it? Or I'm so happy just to listen. Um, but I think we might be surprised at how powerful it is just to listen and ask clarifying questions or say, oh gosh, that sounds so tough. Oh my gosh. And just offer those little things to keep the conversation flowing. But yeah, we don't need to jump in and dismiss it. And 
also for parents to really, I think, hold on to this feeling that their children are resilient, that they are um, not broken, that they are thriving, that they can also take feeling left out, you know, where we're not, we are not sending this energy that like, oh my gosh, this is an emergency. I can't believe nobody sat with you at lunch. I can't believe it. Not that we don't, we, not to take it lightly, obviously, if there is something bad going on, but I think sometimes kids might be hesitant because they're like, oh, I don't want my mom to freak out. I don't want her yeah, to, so, yeah, yeah. or then if they get really worried and they think, oh, so if you can really kind of listen from that space of knowing that they will find their friends, that they will fit out, that this transition going back to school is going to be okay. Um, and I had anxiety about, I don't know if it's anxiety, I had worry about my kids going back to school with COVID because I had just had COVID and they were going back and I was like, I don't want them to go. So I said to them, like, do you want to like stay home again? Um, and my son's like, what would that look like? I mean, just us. And uh, it was... I feel embarrassed to admit that, but I, I was, I thought, cause I had just had COVID and I was vaccinate, vaccinated. I thought, oh my gosh, everyone's going to get sick. And my dad was in the hospital and we didn't know if he had COVID. And it was just, I was, the world seemed really scary to me. So I sat them down. They both really wanted to go back to school. And I, I said, I made the decision that it was going to be so much better for them mentally and just socially and, and great to go back to school. And so I came to peace with, um, all right, you know, if they get sick, if I get sick again, we will we'll be okay no matter what. And we can handle it. And I just came to peace with that. And um, and that was my decision. If parents make a de another decision, that is okay. But I That's think this is, this is very an important point here of highlighting, you know, there are pros and cons to both. Uh, but right now for them to have that basic social interaction going out in the world again is, except, is exceptionally important for the mental health, right? Uh, so just going back into life, getting a structure, getting a routine, uh, getting some healthy youth connections is, is important as well. Yes, I agree. And for me, once I kind of lined up with that, the world actually started to look better. I just, I also felt comfortable with the, the steps that the schools were taking. I also made a point for myself to stay off of social media and not really like I'll read an article here and there, but when I was sick, I found myself really on reading a lot of COVID articles. Cause this was um, mid July when for in the United States, that's when there was a big Delta surge. And so I just was like COVID, COVID, Delta, Delta, you know, and, um, and which is it's funny because I'd actually never had much COVID anxiety in, um, and it was just a few days, but I, I recognized, oh, wow, I'm really in my head. I'm really, so my steps were to kind of get off COVID social media and reading reports of, you know, you know, for me, New York times. And so I, I let go of that and the world started seeming safer. And I'm so happy that my, my kids have been in school for almost two months and there's a new school for them and they are both thriving and they're so happy. So it was the right decision for our family, but just sharing for anybody that it, and my kids had no worries. Um, they were like, they were great. Um, so coming, uh, coming to this whole social media issue, you know, uh, how much of the media consumption, because we do today know that a lot of media consumption leads to high rates of anxiety as well. We've seen it through COVID. We also know high uh, rates of uh, usage of Instagram or the Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat uh, are leading to a lot of addictive behaviors. Yes, I know. And so I think being mindful of your social media. And I know with kids, you know, their brains are still developing. I mean, our brains are still developing until, I don't know, early twenties, honestly. But so for children, they might need a little bit of support from their parents because they might not be able to be as mindful as adults can be. I um, mean, it's still, it's a practice for me. It is really addicting. I'll find myself like last night on TikTok and I'm like, get off. And I'm like, just one more video. But something that I do is you can actually set, um, like time limits on some phones on how long you can be on certain apps. And you can always press ignore. Um, but I think for some parental controls, because it goes both ways, I think that social media can definitely be a way to connect and can be a way to, um, yeah, you, you know, to feel, to feel good and to learn. But I do think when we're on it, we're also disconnected. We're not, we're yeah. not in our, we're not 
in our life so much. And also it's really unregulated. You don't know if you're going to find yourself on watching videos or reading stuff that's actually going to contribute to your anxiety because it might, as I was sharing, it seemed like COVID was all I was thinking about when I had COVID and it can be out of proportion from the beauty and the healing and all of the other things that are going on in the world. Um, I mean, there's, we could have probably a whole discussion on social media because I also think even outside of COVID, if kids are looking for validation, if they post something and they're wanting to get all their friends to like it or leave positive comments. And because of the an anonymity, sometimes people are going to be really cruel and they might leave a mean comment or they, you know, and so it's, it's a way I think for parents and kids to mindful, be very mindful about and, to, and then you can also in a way curate your social media feed, you know, follow people that you like. And so with parents, it might be, if you're having more discussions. And so if your kids Maybe parents could do a good job of modeling too and saying, I started deleting these people or intentionally finding videos that make me feel good. I noticed that I was on COVID TikTok or whatever they might say. And so they said, I started watching animal videos, like nail videos, cooking videos. Um, and so seeing what feels good to you. And for me as a parent, it feels good to read an article, like a news article, rather than I could, I just, I make, for me, I don't watch the news because I feel like it's overwhelmingly negative, but I do like to stay informed. So I'll read an article. So, so I like the tips that you gave. So one was your parental control or self-control on social media through your timings and passwords. Uh, and I think you also mentioned something about the social media feed. So monitor the content that is coming. Uh, in terms of addiction, what would you call addiction? How many hours? Uh, we don't have TikTok in India. It's been banned. Of course, we have uh, Instagram and uh, other platforms. So what would you describe as an addiction today? You know, I don't know. I wouldn't feel like I'm qualified to say what an addiction is. I think it would, I would kind of defer to somebody else. But um, I think if it's negatively impacting your life, you know, um, and I don't, for kids, I don't know if we would have to go labeling it. Yeah. Um, but I think kind of taking the word addiction out, just since I don't feel comfortable speaking to that, but if parents were noticing the, the parents themselves or anybody that's watching this, that they were on social media or their phones much more than they wanted. And it was, you know, also, cause we're all going to sometimes be on our phone and, like, oh, our kids are there, our friends are there, but making an effort to put it down, to leave it, you know, when we're, when we're at dinner or if we're noticing that we're staying up a lot later on our phones. Um, and then for kids, just as, you know, my friend, my kids are, my son doesn't have a phone. He's seven, but he'll watch TV and play video games. But when I say, oh, it's time to turn off, it's totally fine with him. But for some of my friends, I know that their kids, then they just throw a big fit and they have a really hard time. And I'm not saying that's addiction, but it's it's hard for them to stop something that is a really pleasurable activity. Yep. And that's what my friends would say, it doesn't look like you're ready for this right now. You know, and so I think that's why it would be on a case-to-case -case basis. And also about monitoring. I was talking more about adults. So I don't want parents to think that I'm saying to monitor, but I do think it's a case-to-case -case basis where my daughter is that she's not. I never really see her on her phone, but she does have social media, but I had on her, she had to ask, she just has Instagram, but she would used to have to ask me, you know, get my permission to do apps, but well, I don't, I'm know, talking, right? I was talking more about, uh, you know, the teenage, uh, you know, a crowd, which is on Instagram for four to six hours. I mean, of course they come into therapy and they're very honest about it and they know that it's consuming them. Uh, it's not good. They're constantly comparing themselves to celebrities and musicians and things like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it, whether it's an addiction or not, it, it seems like, oh, it's, is that it's not really serving them, you know, that if it's, we want to leave most of the time, maybe making new connections and feeling better. Um, and so that might be also if they, I'm sure when you work with them, they might come to that conclusion themselves like, oh yeah, when I'm on Instagram for six hours, I don't feel good. Yeah. But when I, yeah, you know, actually for, I can tolerate about two hours a day or something like that, or an hour, or cause we, it doesn't have to be zero because I do think sometimes when parents take away their, you know, somebody's phone or their child's phone or iPad at night, I actually have heard that what we want is 
that that's a time that they can feel really lonely and they might connect. So it's, it's really kind of finding a balance of what is going to help them feel good and connect and get enough sleep. Um, and I think the more kind of fluid they conversations they can have with their therapist or with their parents about what is, you know, being mindful about social media consumption. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of panic happening uh, as kids return to school. Uh, just, you know, talking about the panic attack. So we know it's the fight and the flight response. What are some of the symptoms that you would see in, in the population that you deal with? Change in heart rate, you know, so heart palpitations, heart beating fast. And then a lot of times people can think, oh no, am I having a heart attack? Um, and then change in, in breathing, which obviously we could understand if um, the heart is changing, our breathing can changing, but sometimes it's, you know, breathing really, really shallowly. And then when our breathing changes, we can feel lightheaded. We can feel dizzy. Sometimes it can result in feeling disconnected, which might be derealization or depersonalization and derealization can feeling like the world doesn't feel quite real or people don't look quite real or like my hand looks really weird, which a lot of people can think, am I losing my mind? Um, but it can just be a symptom of a panic attack, um, increased mental activity. So it can seem like our thoughts are racing. Sometimes people can be sweating, get chills, a choking feeling, um, like difficulty swallowing, some numbness, like lump numbness, even in like the lips or their hands or tingliness. Um, and there's, I think like 13, if you know, for the DSM five, like 13, but it's like, you don't, so you don't have to have all of these, but sometimes it can be like upset stomach, nausea. Um, and I think those are some of the big ones. And, and can you give, a, give us a self-talk where we can sort of reassure the mind? So, of course, some people don't want to go to the school counselors because they are getting overwhelmed anyways. Uh, and that may be an overwhelming experience because everybody is going to watch you go in there. Uh, so what is, uh, you know, a basic technique that they can use for the moment? Well, and I think what would happen, the best thing would be to understand panic attacks before so great job if they are listening or they're talking to us. So we understand that it is, it's our body's response to thinking that we're in danger. And it can be that we've just had a lot of, lot of worry thinking and how I've learned to view panic attacks is as a signal, you know, everything like our body's always looking out for us. So it's a big signal like, Hey, you've been taking these thoughts too seriously. You've been stressing yourself out with your thoughts, leave your thinking alone. You know, so as best as you can, like, okay, you know, we're not knowing that barring that you're healthy, you know, you, your brain might be like, this time it is a heart attack, you know, oh my gosh, what if you throw up in class? Like, you're going to go crazy. We don't have to not have those thoughts. And if we resist a panic attack, sometimes it can just make it worse. It can make it last longer. So I don't actually offer techniques because I think that sometimes techniques can send the message. Like this is dangerous. Like I got to get rid of it really quickly. But when we understand that we are always designed to come back into balance, if a panic attack starts, you're going to be like, oh, okay, this is, wow. I've, yeah, I've been just, okay. Just as best as you can leave your thinking alone. Um, and, you know, kind of maybe reminding yourself that you are designed beautifully, you're going to come back into balance. And so whatever might ring true to who's ever listening to this, sometimes I'll feel like I don't have panic attacks um, anymore, but a huge turning point was when I stopped resisting them, when I stopped fearing them. So sometimes a really helpful thing can be to understand them. And then you're not going to be on guard because sometimes when people have had a panic attack, then they're thinking, well, I, I never want this to happen. And so they can be like looking out for any symptom. And then they're like, oh no, it's coming. And then it's creating more stress because we're thinking like, no, it's going to be horrible. So if people, one, just know that they've made it through every panic attack, if they get one, we all have this amazing wisdom inside us that they will be guided if it is to get a drink of water, just to sit there, just to put in their headphones. And I'm not saying these are techniques because I think it will be individual for the person right. and for the situation, but the work or the, not the work, but the healing comes before in knowing you don't have to try to prevent panic attacks. You know, the more you resist them, the scarier they're going to seem that 
because that's going to set you up for actually being in a more peaceful place. So you're less likely to have one. But if one comes, okay. Um, and then as much as you can leave your thinking alone. So you're not kind of giving that energy and and then it from you know the panic attack doesn't have to be front page news it doesn't have to be like oh my gosh i can't believe it and then they might be surprised that it's actually over in a few minutes right. um because so panic you're saying, attacks, you're saying don't fight the panic attack yes and don't fear the panic attack yes right let it just come let it just pass let it just flow be mindful yes yeah and it can just be a signal, you know, not that there's anything to do, but it's like, oh, wow, maybe I've been putting a lot of pressure on myself. I've been scaring myself with my thinking. Um, and then it's, yes, I 100% don't fight it and don't fear it. Yeah. Um, it. It's just our body's response. And a lot of times it's just getting out of our body's own way because we are designed to come back into balance. We really are. We're designed really beautifully. And, you know, we've done a lot of studies in psychology talking about attachment styles. Uh, you know, and the anxious styles, uh, attachment styles, the, you know, people becoming overly clingy or overly anxious when they uh, are detached from, uh, you know, with lockdowns and being at home all the time, uh, you know, detaching from your home is going to be a primary issue. Uh, what would you suggest on that? How does one manage these interpersonal relationships? because that anxiety would flow out in other relationships as well. Yes. Well, I think it's again, that it can be a false alarm. You know, we can get in, we can start feeling really safe at home. So when we go outside, you know, our brain, the amygdala can think like, oh my gosh, it can start kind of ringing that bell, like danger. We are, we're not in our safe space. Um, and so, one understanding you don't have to stop that first response because sometimes especially in new situations when we're out of the home more now like new new again situations um you might have that involuntary kind of first fear right. but then right. you can remember oh like that you know your brain is just creating stories you know and remembering that you are safe even though you might get kind of startled um, you know, like say somebody you were out and your friend like jumped around the corner and was like, boo, and startled you. Of course, you're going to get scared. And then you might realize, oh, it's just my friend. Yeah. So if someone, you know, when people are going out, leaving their homes more frequently now, they might notice a lot of people around them and they might get kind of startled like that boo, but then they can remember, oh, it's safe for me to be outside my home, you know, cause we are, we are safe. We're a lot safer than we think. Um, I remember this woman, Dr. Amy Johnson was talking about when it was 4th of July in America and she was holding her little dog and there was all these fireworks and her little dog was just shaking and shaking and shaking. And Amy was realizing he doesn't know how safe he is. He's like, you know, he was in her arms. He's like, you're in my, your mother's arms in Minnesota. Fireworks are miles and miles away, but that dog couldn't understand it. So sometimes when we're leaving our homes, this primitive part of our brain is like, oh no, it's not safe, but, but we are much more expansive than that part of our brain. And we can remember we are so safe, you know, and also that we will be guided to take care of ourselves. If it felt overwhelming, we can take a break to go. We don't need to plan. What am I going to do in these situations and to know that there's this amazing part of us that always has our best interest at heart, that we don't need to plan for things. We'll be guided. I know you talked about relationships too, yep. so we can transition there. Um, and let me think, I took notes because I don't know our questions. And so I'm trying to think if I had had anything helpful. I mean, there's so much I can say about um, relationships. Um, so I, I am just, you know, the patterns of the relationship that were maintained at home, uh, you know, we'll be carrying those patterns back to the social world now that we are going out there. Uh, you know, so is there anything that we need to be cautious about in terms of anxiety? Well, I don't know if there's ever anything that we need to be cautious about. I think anxiety and, and relationships and everything is something to be understood. And so if people are approaching themselves and their new interactions with love and understanding, 
there's nothing to worry about. You know, it's often just our brain kind of makes it much more dramatic and it's going to say like, you've lost your social skills or you're not having as many connections. I don't think this person likes you. You know, they're not texting you back. We want to have compassion for ourselves and other people. So we don't know what this pandemic has been for other people. And so for kids that are going back into school and if they're noticing my friends aren't asking to hang out as much, they're not texting me back to make sure that we're not gonna believe these stories that our brain is creating because everybody else is going through things. So if our friends might not be as chatty enough or we might not be seeing them as much as we did before COVID, you know, our brain might create stories. They don't like us, they're mad at us. And that could probably is just all false because everybody is also having their own experience. Sure. Um, so to really, I think, not create stories or not believe stories because our brain is always going to be a brain. It's always going to be narrating and, um, and kind of telling these stories. And so it can be moving forward with these relationships to take the, whatever your brain is saying, those thoughts going back to like thoughts are not facts. And then really giving everybody a little bit more grace, ourselves included, where if we are in our social interaction, our brain might point out all the th things that we, we did wrong. And we're like, oh, wait, I don't need to, I don't need to believe that to take a step back. And the beautiful thing is our thoughts are transient. They're always going to flow. So when we're not resisting them or we're not giving them a lot of energy and that goes to panic attacks. You know, if we take a step back, our thoughts can flow. So our thoughts might be really scary regarding a panic attack. Is this a heart attack? Am I going to go crazy? Am I going to lose, lose control? And when we're not resisting them and we're not giving them a lot of energy, they flow. Then we have new thoughts and the same things about our relationship. Our brain might be saying, you know, whether it's about something in school or with friendships or with parents or with anybody, our brain is talking and talking. We're letting it do a thing. And then we have new thoughts. We're like, what am I going to eat for lunch? Oh my gosh, what am I going to wear tomorrow? What book am I, you know, and then we have new thoughts and new feelings and it all kind of works a lot better when we don't have to be so in control. The last thing that I wanted to point out is, you know, when you spoke about the pressure that we put on ourselves, uh, and we've seen it that, you know, right now we've been in comfortable spaces at home, going to school is sort of uh, getting you out of that comfort zone. Uh, you know, of course, there's going to be pressure. Of course, there's going to be rejection and failures. That there are going to be obstacles at various uh, steps of the journey. Uh, you know, what are the do's and the don'ts for that? Well, oftentimes we're just putting the pressure on ourselves, you know, where I think a huge thing, my, one of my mentors, Dr. Bill Pettit said that life is too important to take seriously. And, and also he would always say, if I haven't had a hearty laugh by noon, that lets me know I'm taking life way too seriously. And so for kids and adults, you know, to kind of have a pause when we're putting pressure, because it's like, are we taking this too seriously? Um, I know when, if it's a, the first day of school or a test or a dance or lunch, it can seem really, really, really serious. But a lot of time this pressure is just made up by ourselves. And so to open up to, oh, like what, what stories is my brain creating? And, and to know oftentimes when we, when we're thinking of trying to prevent rejection, we're actually creating the suffering, you know, that it's often like by us kind of, I think I'd heard somebody say, stop hiding. That just prolongs the suffering because when we're hiding and we're trying to think, okay, well, what am I going to say? You know, I, I who am I going to eat lunch with? And what am I going to do? We're like, we're just, we're kind of just torturing ourselves because oftentimes this anticipation of something is going to be a lot worse or also than the mental review. Like we're our own worst critics. You know, we, sometimes we're thinking of how we acted at lunch and all these embarrassing things we said or whatever. And then if we ever bring it up to a friend, they're like, what are you, what are you talking about? You know, um, we, a lot of people aren't judging us. And I know sometimes in school, there can be nasty kids, but um, you, how do we treat ourselves? I mean, I think as much as we can with love and understanding, um, taking whatever stories the brain is saying with a grain of salt, you know, if we're using our feelings as guidance too, if we feel bad, that's just an indicator that our thoughts are off. And if we are in a low mood, that is not the time to believe your thoughts. You know, we all have low moods. We all have low thinking at that time, but that is the time that those thoughts are not true. You know, um, right. as you so said, they're transient, you know, so they are going to pass off. 
Yes. Yeah. And so if you're in a low mood and your thoughts are making you feel bad, that's a good indicator that they're false, yes. you know, because, and then, so if they're false, all right, I'm going to leave that, that thinking alone. And, and also to not be in a rush to, as you said, to, since our thoughts flow, we, we don't need to try to hurry them along, or we don't even need to try to hurry our moods along because we're human beings. Our moods are going to go up and down. And if we can be graceful for our low moods and grateful for our high moods, um, and also that everybody has moods, you know, sometimes our teacher might be in a low mood and a student, you know, the best we can to give people grace and not take things personally, yeah. um, because we're all just doing our best. And so for kids to know too, this is teachers are, are going out of their house. There's, I was a school psychologist and I had really bad anxiety. Sometimes I'd have panic attacks often on the way to work in my office. Once I had a panic attack, I even called 911, you know? And so it's like, you know, kids don't have to feel alone like some, there's something's wrong with them. Um, and I know that sometimes if I see anybody that's mean, I'm like, oh, maybe they're anxious, you know, or has like a resting mean face or they seem cold. I no longer, um, and that could be me making up a story. They might not be anxious, but I don't think anybody that's happy and peaceful and present and content is going to be mean. So when people are seeming cold, whether it's a teacher or a friend or a peer or an administrator or somebody that, is serving lunch, it's like, oh, just kind of having this warm feeling for them that they probably are going through their own stuff. Yep. Um, and if we, that I think can help it take us, help us to take things less personally. Yeah. So I think taking perspective is important. Yeah. Yeah. Self-compassion. Would you say that? Oh yeah. my gosh. So much self-compassion. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And also to, if you have a panic attack and you run back home. That's okay. You know, it's enough just to see, oh, I, I overdid it. I resisted it. Or I ran a home, no need to feel guilty or to feel ashamed, just so much love and compassion. And to really see the big picture that this is, you know, it doesn't have, you don't have to get it perfect. This first week of going back to school or this first month, or like, this is, we have the rest of our lives to live and take transitions in stride and be compassionate to ourselves. Thank you so much. I think the last line, uh, take your transition in stride, uh, be compassionate to yourself, choose your perspective. Uh, you know, I think we've got your thoughts are not facts. We've got some strong statements out there. I'm sure the talk is very helpful. I would just like Lily, can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing back there? Yes, yes. Um, I primarily now do what I call anxiety coaching. Yep. And so I work with people one-on-one -on -one. and sometimes we meet for half an hour, sometimes an hour, and we talk about anything. And sometimes it actually moves over, not even just anxiety about life. Yep. I also do groups where we meet live on Zoom and sometimes they're just general anxiety. And then I also do specific groups. Some areas that I'll focus on are intrusive thoughts, which are unwanted thoughts that a, a lot of people can mistakenly think mean something about them. And so I'll focus on that or health anxiety, which I know we didn't, we covered a tiny bit starting about COVID, but um, I'll do health anxiety groups or relationship groups. So as I said, sometimes narrow and sometimes specific. I also have something where people can ask me questions and I do a live video. Um, yeah. Sometimes I try to make it more affordable for everybody. And then I do a lot of stuff on social media, on Instagram. And I have a podcast now with the woman who introduced me to the three principles, which trans which changed my life and which are the basis of everything that I was talking about today. Right. So they're not anything weird. And we just started a podcast together right. um, on mental well-being. And wow. so that's that's about me. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. And then I'm a mom. Hmm. And I think we're going to we're going to take all those uh, tips from you. We're going to put out your website, your uh, your podcast channel uh, on on our platform. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for Thank having you. me. Yeah, it was very insightful.